Kim One Single Board Computer? I hope you're using it and not just collecting it. These things were made to be enjoyed, not to sit in display cases or up on a shelf. Now one thing about using them, if you want to get the most out of it, you probably want to learn how to expand them. To expand them, it's going to require you to understand how the address space of them is set up, what's available for you, and how address decoding works. These are probably novice topics to most of you, but in case you're a beginner or you just started learning how these things work, the first half of the video will be informative for you. The second half of the video, it's a couple examples of me hooking up some expansions to it. Mainly just a couple EEPROMs to map in code, but it should show you how it works overall. So sit back, relax, let's have some fun. The heart of the MOS technology Kim One is, no surprise, the MOS 6502 CPU. The 6502 has a 16-bit address bus, so you can see highlighted in blue all 16 address lines from A0 through A15 hanging off the CPU. I highlighted the entire address bus of the Kim One in blue here also because it's key to understand that there is only one address bus the 6530-002, 6530-003, and all of the RAM are connected to the same address bus. Not every chip on the address bus has 16 address lines. Each chip has enough address lines to support its internal address space. Both 6530 chips and all the RAM chips have only 10 address lines. For expansion purposes, however, the Kim One makes all 16 address lines available on its expansion connector. I'll be connecting to the address lines on the expansion connector in both of the examples I run through in this video. Now that we have a better understanding of the Kim One's address bus, let's talk about address decoding. What is it, why is it needed, and how does it work? Let's pretend the CPU throws memory address hex 1C22 on the bus. I'm putting the binary representation of 1C22 on the screen and I'm highlighting the address lines that are enabled so you can see that the address lines that it will light up correspond with the binary digits of that address. Now, here's where things get sticky. Remember all these chips are on the same bus and the same address lines are now active on each chip. How do the chips know which one is supposed to respond? This is why address decoding is needed. Address decoding logic is what determines which chip is active for any given memory location. We know what it is and why we need it, so how does address decoding work? On the Kim One, this 74145 logic chip over here at U4 is what is responsible for the bulk of the address decoding for the entire board. I say the bulk and not all because there is some magical address decoding stuff happening within the 6530s also. Observe that the A10, A11, and A12 address lines connect to the A, B, and C inputs of the 74145. Based on those inputs, pin 9 is pulled low which activates the K7 chip select. K7 is connected to pin 4 of 6530-002 which is the ROM select line. This is how the 6530-002 knows that it's supposed to be active. Let's take a look inside the 74145 so we can see what's going on there. Here's the truth table. I'll connect A10, A11, and A12 to make it easier to illustrate how this works. You can see how A, B, and C are used as inputs. There are 10 valid input combinations shown on the left with the resulting output combinations shown on the right. I'll explain input D a little later, but for now, just know that it's always going to be low. In our example address, hex 1C22, bits 10, 11, and 12 are all 1s. So address lines A10, A11, and A12 are all high. Row 7 shows that the output will be all pins high except output 7, which is pin 9 of the 74145. That pin will act as the chip select. I'll extend the table a bit here to confirm what we already saw on the schematic. Output 7 maps to Kim 1 memory block K7. I'll throw a memory map up on the screen for a very quick review. This memory map shows how the Kim 1's address space is divided into 8 1 kilobyte blocks of memory that are named K0 through K7. It's the 74145 at U4 that makes this happen by taking address lines A10, A11, and A12 in as inputs and activating a single given chip select output pin based on the input. The first 1K block is K0, which maps to the onboard RAM. That's used for zero page, the stack, and user memory. It's an architectural requirement of the 6502 to have RAM at the bottom of the address space for zero page in the stack. K1 through K4 are decoded for expansion. Nothing on the Kim One uses these chip selects or the address space they're mapped to. Rather, they're just waiting for you to connect to them to expand your Kim One. K1 
Cave 5 maps to both of the 6530's I.O. timer and RAM locations. This is what I meant earlier when I mentioned that they do some of their own address decoding magic internally. K6 is the 6530-003 ROM, and finally K7 is the 6530-002 ROM. That is how the entirety of the Kim 1's onboard address space is decoded. The 6502 can address 64K, but internally the Kim 1 is effectively an 8K system. This is what the memory map means when it shows that everything from 2K through FFFF is available for expansion. The CPU can address it, but nothing on the Kim 1 board attempts to decode the A13, A14, and A15 address lines. If you want to expand your Kim 1, you have two options. The easy but limited way, use the four 1K chunks that are already decoded, or do your own address decoding and use the entire range from hex 2000 through FFFF. Let's turn to the Kim 1 user manual now and get some guidance on how to expand the Kim 1. Memory and I.O. expansion, page 71. This page shows us the 4K expansion method. This is the easy way. There's nothing to build here. This shows U4 on the Kim 1 board taking address pins 10, 11, and 12 as input and decoding them into the K0 through K7 1K blocks as output. To use K1 through K4 to expand your Kim 1, you don't have to do anything other than use the chip select signals provided for you at the application connector. To show you examples, I'm going to expand my Kim 1 by adding extra ROM. I'll burn a 4K2732 EEPROM and an 8K2764 EEPROM with the same code. The example from page 9 of Jim Butterfield's first book of Kim. It's only 9 bytes of code, but that'll be sufficient to demonstrate how expansion works. Most of the effort here is very basic stuff, so I won't spend a lot of time talking about the details. We need to give the 2732 power, then wire it to the address and data lines of the Kim 1, which are exposed at the expansion connector. Once we have all the chip's needs met, we simply connect one of the K1 through K4 chip select lines from the application connector to the chip enable pin of the EEPROM. Eight data lines need to be connected. Now the address lines. Even though this is a 4K EEPROM, the Kim 1 carved K1 through K4 into 1K chunks. So I'm only going to connect enough address lines to address 1K of the EEPROM. The rest will be wasted. A10 and A11 will be tied to ground since I won't be using them. That line above output enable means the logic is inverted and OE is active low, so I'll tie that to ground also. The last thing I need to connect is the chip select pin of the 2732. That will get its chip select pulse from K1, K2, K3, or K4 over at the Kim1 application connector. You can choose whichever one you want depending on which address you want your EEPROM to be mapped in at. K1 for 0400, K2 for 0800, K3 for 0C00, or K4 for hex 1000. I'm going to connect to K1, which is exposed on pin C of the application connector. Finally, the 74145 requires the use of pull-up resistors on its output lines. That's all there is to it. We should see Jim Butterfield's example program starting at hex 0400.
That was fun. Now let's take a look at expanding above hex 2K, which will require us to do our own address decoding. Up near the top, it's showing the onboard 74145 at U4. We already covered how this works. Inputs on A, B, and C, outputs of 1K blocks from K0 through K7. No surprises. Over to the left, we start to get into the interesting bits. Remember the Kim one does not decode address lines A13 through A15 at all. So here's where the expansion circuit comes in. AB13 through AB15 are fed into an external address decoder using inputs A, B, and C. This chip is labeled 74142, but I'm quite certain that's just a typo. Input D is tied to ground. Since AB15 is the highest address line on the 6502, there will never be an input on D. The output of this 74145 breaks up the 64K address space of the 6502 into eight chunks of 8K each. Output zero is interesting. Observe that it goes up here to pin K on the application connector. Now, remember when you built the power supply for your Kim 1, and the instructions told you to wire pin K of the application connector to ground. And remember earlier when I said that input D of U4 would always be low. Now you know why input D was always low, because it was tied to ground. So, to enable the address space above hex 2K, you'll need to change how you wired your power supply. I added a switch there. So, what output 0 does is it activates the onboard U4 address decoder when all three bits from A13 to A15 are low meaning it's an address in the first 8K of memory, so it just hands right back off to U4 to do its regular job. The remaining outputs each go to another 74145, and each of those 74145s will break their assigned 8K blocks into eight 1K blocks. So this circuit you see here will yield 64K of address space decoded into 1K blocks. The last thing I need to mention on this page before I move on is down at the bottom, vector select. This diagram doesn't make it obvious how important this is. The 6502 CPU is hardwired to find its NMI, reset, and IRQ vector addresses starting at hex FFFA. If these memory locations aren't mapped, the 6502 simply can't boot. This brings up a couple interesting points. I wanted the great detail about the Kim 1's address space and was quite clear that the Kim 1 only decodes 8K of address space from hex 0000 to hex 1FFF. Before we even talk about issues related to expanding the Kim 1, how does an unexpanded Kim 1 boot if there's no memory mapped above hex 1FFF and the 6502 expects to find its reset vector at hex FFFC? This table I showed you earlier will help to demonstrate what happens when the CPU tries to address its vector location starting at FFFA. Because the Kim 1 doesn't natively decode address pins A13 through A15, when the CPU puts FFFA on the address bus, those three highest bits are effectively thrown away. If you turn off the three high bits of FFFA, you end up with one FFA. If you look at the Kim 1 ROM code on the 6530s, you'll see that this is where the NMI, reset, and IRQ vectors live. When the CPU fetches FFFA, it's actually getting one FFFA and doesn't even realize it. Let's take what we've learned and put it to work. Instead of using the circuit in this example, I'm going to just expand my Kim 1 by 8K using a single 2764 EEPROM. I'll still have to include my own 74145, and I'll connect the K1 output of that to the chip enable pin on my EEPROM. That will map the EEPROM in at hex 2000. As with the previous example, I'm not going to go into a ton of detail here. This time I'm connecting a 2764-8K EEPROM. Unlike in the prior example when I was constrained to only using 1K of the 4K 2732 EEPROM, I'll be able to use all 8K of the 2764. Like with the 2732, I'll get power, data lines, and address lines to start. Unlike the 2732 example, this time we need to do address decoding, so I'll need to add a 74145 to the board. Data lines are next. Now address lines. I'll connect the read-write pin at pin W on the expansion connector to the output enable pin on the 2764. 
to map our EEPROM at hex 2000. I'll connect output 1 of the 74145 to the chip select of the EEPROM. The A, B, and C inputs to the 74145 will come from the address lines we need to decode, A13, 14, and 15 on pins R, S, and T of the expansion connector. I don't want to leave any floating inputs, so D goes to ground. Zero goes to pin K on the application connector, and remember you need to remove short to ground from pin K. This hands off the low 8K to be decoded on the board. Seven goes to pin J on the application connector. This will map in the reset vector. All the outputs from the 74145 require pull-up resistors. That's it. Now let's watch it work. We should find Jim Butterfield's example code at hex 2000. If I want my EEPROM to be mapped in at hex 4000, it's as simple as connecting output 2 to the EEPROM's chip enable pin instead of output 1.